first uh, Amber Colloquium of the Year. Uh, we're delighted to have with us today uh, Ted Glasser from Stanford University, Department of Communication. And uh, he's going to be talking today, uh, the title of his talk is Ethics and Eloquence in Journalism, What It Means to Take Accountability Seriously. Uh, Ted has written a number of books, including uh, Custodians of Conscience, Investigative Journalism, and Public Virtue. Uh, he's uh, edited Public Opinion and the Communication of Consent, and the idea of public journalism as well. Published numerous articles in Journal of Communication, Journalism and Mass Communication Quarterly, Critical Studies in Mass Communication, and a number of other leading communication journals. Um, in 2002-2003, uh, Ted was the president of the uh, Association for Education in Journalism and Mass Communication. And he's also a former uh, head of the Mass Communication Division and vice president of the International Communication Association. Uh, Ted went to Stanford in 1990 uh, from uh, the University of Minnesota. And uh, he did his PhD work at uh, the University of Iowa. So it's really a delight to have you here with us, Ted. Uh, we've had a nice time talking with you about a number of your ideas. And uh, we look forward to uh, what you have to say about ethics and eloquence uh, in journalism. Thank you. If you don't mind, I'll pace around as I talk, so podiums make me a little uncomfortable and nervous. Um, first, I, I want to thank uh, Peter and Sasha and Kate and others for being such kind hosts. I had not had a chance to visit USC before, so I enjoyed the opportunity not, to, not only to catch up with, with friends, Francois and Hernan and others, but to meet some people I haven't met before. I um, got a chance to have a nice conversation with Larry, who I very rarely get a chance to sit down and have an extended conversation with. So um, my appreciation for bringing me out here. Let me uh, provide a little context for my few comments this afternoon and then go into the formal pre presentation itself. A little background on how I ended up uh, focusing my attention on questions of ethics and how I ended up equating or trying to equate um, ethics with accountability by way of this notion of, of eloquence. I am by predisposition a, a journalism educator. By journalism educator I mean someone who's interested in the study of journalism but also with a, a, uh, an appreciation for the relationship between the study of journalism and the practice of journalism. Um, rather than seeing those as disconnected and separate domains, I'm very interested in seeing how we can bring this together. It's, it's a self-interest, obviously. Uh, um, I'm interested in educating journalists to make journalism better, not simply to recreate the, uh, the status quo. And here's the problem we've faced in, in journalism education over the years. And I, and I say we because I'm you know, very much part of, of that problem and I hope to be part of the solution as well. We have modeled ourselves on the traditional professions of law and medicine in the sense that we have been struggling to find over the years, over the decades, a foundational knowledge for journalism similar to, at least in design and scope, the foundational knowledge that exists in law and, and medicine, and we failed miserably. I mean, to the point where I think most of us in journalism education would now acknowledge there is no foundational knowledge in journalism. There will be no foundational knowledge in journalism and we ought to think in different ways about what role journalism education plays. Now that's not in any way to belittle or to demean the importance of the study of journalism with regard to the practice of journalism. It is to say that the study of journalism doesn't exist for purposes of steering or managing um, the competent management of conduct. Right? It's not foundational knowledge in the sense that you need it in order to do well in journalism. But rather the study of journalism becomes important because it provides a context in which to critique journalism, which allows journalism to get better and better and journalists to get better and better. Um, what do I mean by, by, by foundational knowledge? Think of the traditional professions and think of the knowledge we would demand lawyers and physicians to have before we would let them practice medicine, or law, and you, and you can appreciate <coughs> why law schools and med schools have an interest in foundational knowledge. You don't want a surgeon right, operating on anyone unless they've taken the anatomy course, right? Think how uncomfortably you would feel. Um, not only if you hadn't taken the course, what did you get in anatomy? Uh, I struggled with that one. Um, 
That, that makes you uncomfortable. Um, and same with law, you need to know the rules of evidence, you need to know what, what value and what role precedents play in law. I mean, you heard some of this in the, in the Roberts confirmation hearings, some of the foundational knowledge that, that lawyers have. Um, but there's really no foundational knowledge in journalism. I mean, although journalism educators have many times sat around tables asking themselves, what would we require journalists to know, not do, know before we would say they're prepared to practice journalism. And it's a very short list, and it's a list, list that's very idiosyncratic. Your list and my list are not likely to overlap with the possible exception of Walter Lippmann. And then you wonder, is reading public opinion really going to make you any better in the newsroom? You know, probably not, right? Um, so there's not that kind, kind of foundational knowledge. What there is, though, is the kind of knowledge that all professions share, and it's the kind of knowledge you acquire in the field through experience, tied to practice. Right? The kind of knowledge that you can only gain when you appreciate the relationship between practice and experience. That practice requires practice. The ambiguity of the term practice, meaning practice in, in the sense of repetition, but practice also in the sense of, of applying what you've learned through repetition. So even in medicine and law, right? You do have that foundational knowledge, but you also have that knowledge in the field that is absolutely essential. And there's a, a wonderful author who's been writing over the years for The New Yorker, a man named Atul Gawande, who came out with a book version of what I'm about to summarize. He talks about how surgeons, he's a surgeon in Boston, how surgeons learn to be surgeons. Well, they begin with the anatomy course, but sooner or later, they have to begin to practice surgery. And, and he was talking about the kinds of surgery students surgeons look for. And it's not the student with great manual dexterity. What kind of student they look for? They look for the boneheaded, stubborn student who's willing to perform the same task over and over and over again to the point where they can do it in their sleep. And that's exactly the sign of a good surgeon, right? Who can tie that knot in his or her sleep. That the practice of surgery is so well ingrained that it's understood, and here's the point I want to develop for a minute, it's understood at the level of common sense. Right? It's commonsensical. So let me talk a little bit about common sense and then tie that to this notion of ethics and then use that as a, a way of getting into the relationship between ethics and accountability. Because what I want to argue, and I'm doing this without reference to footnotes, which is a little intellectually dishonest, so let me give you the four people whose work I'm relying on in case you want to read up on this. But it's a, a, a strange combination, or if you will, a creative misapplication of the works of um, Habermas, Gadamir, Goertz, and Gramsci. Um, and those of you familiar with the works will, 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 will see how I'm abusing that. Um, but that, that's, that saves me having to go back and, and constantly mention these names as I'm going through this presentation, which would slow things down and make things even more tedious than they will be. Um, but common sense, and we all know what common sense means at the level of common sense, but I want to unpack it a little so that we can, we can put some of its attributes on the table. And that's where, really, that's where Gertz is helping me a lot. Gertz wrote this wonderful little essay on, in a book called Local Knowledge on, Gert, uh, on common sense as a system of thought. Um, and he describes some of the attributes of common sense. Common sense is, and this is a word that Gertz makes up, um, common sense is immethodical which is to say it's ad hoc. There's no methods associated with common sense. You just do it. Common sense is natural and obvious and self-evident and, and easily accessible to anyone. It's common and shared. Ordinary people have common sense. Right? You don't need any specialized training or knowledge to know common sense. You just need to have your eyes open right, and be awake and live in a world in your particular community. And common sense will rub off. And we know what we call people where that doesn't happen. right? You know, people who don't know common sense or defy common sense. They're the odd ones out in the community. All right, so common sense um, is always, Gertz suggests, always practical. Common sense is always practical. There's nothing abstract about common sense. We don't employ it in the abstract. We employ it in practical situations. And common sense is always about, and this is its connection to ethics, um, common sense is always about doing the right thing doing the right thing. When you violate common sense, you've done the wrong thing. 
Now, we don't know our own common sense very well for obvious reasons. It's common and shared and take it for granted and, and seem to be natural and self-evident. You know, everybody knows it and anybody can do it. But we are confronted with common sense every time we leave our own community and experience somebody else's common sense. All right, so we've all had that experience when we've gone overseas and, and noticed that what was natural to us is quite different to somebody else, right? You know, to the point where, you know, it's not simply different, it's wrong. What's the matter with these people? Why are they driving on that side of the road? Don't they know? Um, I mean, driving on the right side of the road is natural. It's God-given. It's self-evident. Everyone knows that. Yeah, until you go to a country where that's not the case, and it's very unnerving, and it, and it takes some adjustment to the point where many of us, certainly myself, I won't drive in a, in a country where they drive on the wrong side of the road because it's going to take too much concentration. That's exactly what common sense doesn't require. Common sense doesn't require thought. It requires doing. It's the kind of knowledge you acquire through experience, the kind of practical knowledge Aristotle talked about when he talked about practical wisdom. Um, it's not the kind of propositional knowledge associated with treatises and theories. Right? That's not where we get our common sense. Right? Common sense is what accounts for riding a bike, tying a shoelace, and being a surgeon. Right? Common sense, we all have common sense, we're all in awe of. Right? The common sense that applies to musicians and athletes. Right? Don't we wish we had that common sense? But common sense is also, also a, a form of knowledge that is very difficult to articulate, very difficult to explain. Um, I mean, try explaining to someone how to tie a shoelace. Try explaining to someone how to ride a bike. You don't. You show them, usually. You know? And that's how you learn common sense. You imitate, and through practice and through experience, finally, sooner or later, you're able to do it. And it's like an epiphany. All of a sudden, you're able to ride a bike without falling down. All of a sudden, you're able to tie a shoelace or not. Right? All of a sudden, you're able to pay, play an instrument in a way that sounds like you're playing an instrument as opposed to simply practicing. Um, and this explains why the people who do things so easily, you know, the, the, the great athletes and the great artists do things so easily, are the people who have spent so much time, usually behind closed doors, so much time practicing. Practicing, 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 practice to the point where it's, where it's second nature. So what I'm interested in doing is understanding ethics at the level of common sense. And let me explain why I want to associate ethics with common sense and why I want to understand common sense, uh, ethics rather, as something that's practical. Not theoretical, not abstract, not conceptual, but practical. And this is the, my, the application of, of some of uh, Gadamir's work who suggests, it's in his book, Truth and Method, where he suggests um, that there's a close relationship between technical knowledge and ethical knowledge. And I, and I want to translate that into a close connection between practical knowledge and, and ethical knowledge. That most of us know right from wrong as a practical matter. We don't need to stop and study anything. Right. You grow up in a community, you grow up in the United States today, you have a, a very clear and definite sense of right from wrong. And you may not be able to articulate why. And this is where Gramsci comes in. Right? Common sense is full of contradictions and full of paradoxes and full of tensions and inconsistencies. Common sense is a system of thought, is a mess. But it's what we rely on. So I want to honor where we get our ethics from, rather than pretending that it comes from somewhere else. We don't learn right from wrong from studying Kant. We learn right from wrong from growing up wherever we grow up and having our eyes and ears open. But that kind of commonsensical ethics needs to be rehabilitated. And that's where I want to go with this presentation. The rehabilitation as aspects of common sense is, of course, for those of you familiar with his work, um, Habermas's discourse ethics, you know, how we're going to rehabilitate common sense. We begin with common sense because that's where knowledge begins, ethical knowledge begins, but that's not where it should end up. And then finally, if I can do this in a few minutes, tie it back to how this might uh, reinvigorate the study of journalism and the education of, uh, of journalists. So let me, let me uh, talk a little bit more about the, the nation of, notion of uh, ethical knowledge. And, and its connection to common sense. Common sense requires, as I said, no specialized training, no formal education. Um, 
just as journalism requires no formal education, no specialized training. Um, you know, as, as much as we may, might not like to say this too loud in, in schools and programs of journalism, all right, just as no one needs a degree in political science to be a great politician and no one needs a degree in business school to run a great business, no one needs a degree in literature to write a great American novel, no one needs a degree in criminology to, well, you know, I was going to say something overtly partisan, but nah. Um, you don't need a degree in journalism to be a, a great journalist. Indeed, you don't need a college degree. Um, there, you know, newsrooms are scattered with all sorts of interesting people, um, many of whom, although it's rapidly changing, many of whom didn't go to college. Uh, you read in the recent obituary of Peter Jennings. I think he had a high school diploma or maybe dropped out of high school. Uh, dropped out. Um, and you know, it, it didn't slow down his career, which began in his early 20s. Um, he moved up quickly and, and did very well. Um, and in large newsrooms over time, have had any number of examples uh, like that. Now, understanding common sense as requiring no special training runs counter to the notion of professionalism. All right, professionals, doesn't matter who they are, whether they're journalists or lawyers or physicians or, I dare say, educators, um, like to make the claim that ethical knowledge in their field is a matter of specialty. It's an exclusive domain. Right? Um, you know, I, I am in a position to judge the propriety of my conduct in ways that you're not because you're an outsider. Right? And in that sense, no one likes accountability. Right? Physicians don't want to be held accountable except among themselves. Right? Lawyers don't want to be, journalists don't want to be, and we don't want to be either, right? We don't like it when state legislatures, if you're at a state school, start asking us tough questions about why this curriculum or not. You know, our first response is, well, you don't understand, or leave me alone, or academic freedom, autonomy, and so, you know, all the, all the kinds of claims that journalists will make when accountability is, is imposed on them. But common sense suggests that ethics, knowing right from wrong, requires no specialized training. Now, if you look at the bigger issues in the professions, um, I think this will, it'll make some, some sense to you. That the big issues, the big ethical questions in medicine are questions of life and death. Um, quality of health care. Um, or the, the biggest question of all, what is life? When does life begin? When does life begin? When does life end? The euthanasia question. And the point I'm making is that those questions are not in any way technical. That physicians, medical researchers, should in no way enter the discussion by trying to trump other people's interests and expressions. That physicians know no more about when life begins than you do, or I do, or anyone else does. Same with the basic questions of justice that lawyers are concerned with. Now, we're not, we're not suggesting that lawyers don't need specialized training or physicians don't need specialized training, but the, biggest, the big main ethical questions in any of the professions are not questions that are professional in nature, but questions that are social and cultural in nature and should involve all of us. And this is Habermas's argument about ethical questions should concern everyone affected by them. Everyone affected by them should be in a position where they can competently participate in resolutions of those contested areas. Everyone. Right? And of course, everyone has to enter that debate, and this is, a, this is difficult, everyone has to enter that debate, debate independent of their credentials. Independent of their credentials. So that the only thing that prevails in a debate is the quality of the argument, not the credentials of the people making the argument. That's a very difficult thing to do, particularly in universities, which are preoccupied with credentials. All right. and, and journalism, which is even more preoccupied with credentials. You know, when you look at you know, who gets quoted and why they get quoted and under what conditions they get quoted, you, get, you begin to develop an appreciation for journalism's preoccupation with credentials, which is the antithesis of what Habermas is arguing for. That what journalists need to be paying attention to is the quality of the argument independent of the person's credentials. So in terms of ethics and debates, I'm suggesting that questions of professional ethics are not in any way technical and not in any way the domain of the profession. They are the proper domain of the larger community. Right? That it's the larger community that has a vested interest in the resolution of, of, of uh, 
ethical questions, and then that, that can't take place to the extent that professionals exclude them, which is precisely what professionals tend to do. Um, professionals, and you know this from your own experiences, professionals tend to write their own codes of ethics for themselves to be policed by themselves. Right. Very seldom do professionals, any of the professions, invite the public to participate in the formulation of those codes. And even if they do, they're very reluctant to invite the public to participate in the enforcement of the code. Now, sometimes they're forced to do that. Um, but that's not to say that they're eager to do that. Um, you can talk about police departments and community review boards. You can talk about the ABA and the uh, AMA and, and their mechanisms for accountability. And of course, the most extreme example is, um, is journalism, which has a historic aversion to any form of accountability. There's a, a wonderful little essay that Jim Carrey wrote um, it was a number of years ago, maybe 15, 20 years ago, called Journalists Just Leave, which was a title he picked up from a, a Hastings Center um, talk about journalists. And it was Art Kaplan, who was at, at the time heading the Hastings Center. Hastings Center is a, a kind of an ethics think tank in New York that invites various professional groups to um, join them for discussions about professional ethics. And, and, and Kaplan was comparing um, the response to these discussions by the various professions. You know, we bring in the physicians and, and they leave and they form committees. We bring in lawyers and they, they form commissions and blue ribbon panels. And we bring in journalists and they just leave. Um, journalists don't want to do anything about ethics. You know, they don't want to create committees. They don't want to create study groups. They don't want to create blue ribbon councils. In fact, when somebody does create a Blue Ribbon Council, journalists are, are, are known to, historically, denounce the very creation of it for fear that it's going to turn out to be a quasi-state operation that's going to infringe on the autonomy and independence of journalists. So journalists weren't at all keen on even the, the Hutchins Commission that was created in the 1940s, which was funded by Henry Luce of Time magazine. But when you go back and you look at the editor and publisher accounts, of the idea of the commission and, and, and the journalism, the newsroom response to the commission's report in the late 1940s, a whole series of volumes, it was one of dismay. Not, you know, these are interesting questions we ought to think about. It wasn't like, let's, let's set aside some time in the newsroom to talk about this. It was, they don't know anything about journalism. They don't know what they're talking about. This is largely irrelevant to the practice of, of journalism. So there's a lot to, uh, a lot to overcome here. So I'm, the connection then between common sense and ethics is, is a crucial place to begin um, in the sense that ethics, to the extent that it's located at the level of common sense, is moved to the community and taken away from the individual. Now, I don't know whether that sounds like a radical claim for you or not. In the context of journalism, it's a bizarre claim. Almost every journalism text I'm familiar with, including the most recent and most well-known and most highly regarded um, Rosenstiel and, and Kovacs' uh, Elements of Journalism, which is now reprinted in eight, nine, ten languages. It's, it's, it's being well received all over the world, not just in the United States. Reduces ethics to questions of conscience. What's right to do? You gotta decide. Even when we develop arguments about conduct, in the final analysis, it's still reduced to the level of, of conscience. It's an individual dilemma. Individuals need to wrestle with it. And so I'm trying to move journal journalism ethics and ethics in general away from the idea that it's a matter of conscience um, and toward the idea that it's a matter of consensus in the community. Now, consensus in the community, as Habermas describes it, is a regulative ideal. It's not an empirical claim, and, and you need to appreciate the distinction between the two. Habermas is not suggesting that we will arrive at a consensus in the community. He's suggesting that we want to move in the direction of arriving at a consensus in the community. Moving in that direction is how we want to understand ethics. We want to understand ethics then as a process, not as a final claim. As a process that we want to sustain as opposed to something that we can achieve. Does that make sense? A process we want to sustain rather than a claim that we can finally achieve. And in, in any of the big areas, right, we're not going to resolve the big moral questions. For Habermas, those are the conditions for more debate and discussion 
not for less debate and discussion. And in fact, most of the, most of the ethical quandaries in journalism um, aren't ethical quandaries at all. They're egregious violations of what everyone knows is right. You know, so I was, in some ways, dumbfounded by all the attention paid to Jason Blair and, and this follows on Janet Cook in the 1980s and, and I'm forgetting the guy's name, Kelly at USA Today and Glass at Harvard, a whole bunch of scandals. Um, but not very interesting in the sense that there was no one defending Jason Blair. It, it was a great story and it will be, or it is already a great movie. Um, Glass. Which? Glass. Yeah, right. Um, but it, it's, it's, a, it's a scandal story. It's not an interesting ethical debate because everyone knew that what Jason Blair did was wrong. The really interesting debates tend not to be debated that much. In fact, if you look at the codes of ethics from the SPJ code to the ASNE code, they're more or less statements of the obvious. Well, of course journalists shouldn't lie. Well, of course they should be truthful and, and so on and so on and so on. So the really interesting ethical questions don't get covered by codes, don't get debated and discussed, and those are the ones that need the discussion and, and the debate. Um, the most. The problem with common sense, and this is you know, the, the claim that Gramsci makes over and over again, that common sense is basically flawed. It may be the system of thought we rely on, but it's not a very good system of thought because it's disconnected, it's full of contradictions, it's full of paradoxes and, and tensions. Um, if you step back and look at it and try to unpack it, and it's very difficult to articulate, you know, which is why you know, you, you know, one of the most interesting set of interviews on television are interviews with athletes who aren't doing well, you know, which is essentially going up to an athlete and saying, this is a very unfair thing to do, going up to an athlete and saying, um, why can't you hit the ball anymore? You know, unpack common sense for me. Well, you know, we can't do that. And so they say silly things like, I'm in a slump, which means I can't hit the ball and I can't tell you why I can't hit the ball, and then you fall back on superstitions. Well, maybe if I pull my right ear when I'm getting, getting up to the plate, you know, I'll be able to regain whatever it is that I lost. And, and same thing with, you know, we all have our own you know, superstitions about you know, wh where and when and under what, what conditions will, that, will I ever be able to write again. Um, I think that's an academic's nightmare. You know, I, I wrote that good paragraph four years ago. What, what was I doing then and can I do it again? <laughs> and, and why not? Um, well, those are very, thing, very difficult things to to unpack. So if you combine, and, and I don't want to go too much longer, if you combine a little of Gramsci and a little of Goetz and a little of Gadamer and you shake it up, that's kind of a shortcut for saying there's a lot of stuff here I'm not going to get a chance to, to talk about, um, but I want to leap to the notion of rehabilitation. I want to take commonsensical knowledge that exists and celebrate it because that's how we know what's right and wrong and at the same time recognize that we need to find a mechanism for rehabilitating it, making it better, and making it more transparent. And this is where the notion of eloquence comes in. By eloquence, I mean equating ethics with accountability for purposes of rehabilitating common sense. Purposes of rehabilitating common sense. That the most important contribution the study of journalism can make to the education of journalists is instilling that eloquence, engendering that kind of eloquence in students to the point where students are able to talk openly and publicly and candidly, not only about what they do, but why they do it. Right. That's what I mean by accountability. And then in, in a second I want to talk about what are the formal mechanisms for that accountability. Because the press is in a, in a, in a unique position to provide a public forum for that kind of accountability that would be much more difficult uh, for other institutions. But rehabilitating common sense is a way of transforming or translating what Donald Schoen, an MIT researcher, describes as knowing in action to reflection in action. Knowing in action is the kind of knowledge we gain through practice. You know, I know how to play an instrument because I've been playing an instrument for 20 years. I may have never studied anything formally about that instrument, but I play it pretty well. A lot of people learn how to play the harmonica that way. They pick it up and they keep playing with it and toying with it and playing with it and sooner or later they're able to play it pretty well and next thing you know it's Bob Dylan. Right? Um, and there are endless examples of people who have acquired knowledge without any formal background. Many gifted musicians don't read music um, and it, it has to slow them down at all. But it's very difficult for them to talk about their music in ways that would be anywhere similar to people who have had the formal education. And so 
there is a connection, I think, between uh, formal education and being articulate, being eloquent about what it is that you do, even if it doesn't make what you do any better. That's not the point. The point <coughs> is accountability. The point is being in a position where you're able to defend and justify what you did to people who have no vested interest in your conduct. Right? People who have no vested interest in your profession, in your craft, but are affected by what you do. Are affected by what you do. And this is the notion of, of, of uh, um, discourse ethics taking place in the larger community, not within the professional community, in the larger community where people are affected by your conduct but have no vested interest in the press. They don't know about the First Amendment. They don't care about the First Amendment. They don't care about the history and the mythology of American journalism. You're going to need to make your case to people who don't have that background. And that's not an easy thing to do, but it's absolutely crucial in this notion of rehabilitating common sense. That through this practice, the practice of practicing being eloquent, we have an opportunity to translate knowing in action into reflection in action, which is a way of saying, not only, you know, having, having had the experience over and over again of trying to, or having to, be eloquent about what I do and why I do it, I am now rethinking why I'm doing it and how I'm doing it. Um, and, that, and that is the process through which ethics improves, rather than simply describes, improves the practice of journalism. Now, what would those mechanisms look like in a practical sense? You know, what do I mean when I say journalists need to be publicly eloquent um, in their discussions of, of their conduct? Well, we have a history in the United States, a history of failures in those mechanisms. You know, we've, we've tried a number of them, and they haven't worked well, in part because journalists resist them. And I think we need to wear down that resistance by making this argument that ethics isn't something that you dominate. Ethics isn't something that's exclusively a newsroom discussion. It's a public discussion. All right, so in, in American journalism, and it's very different elsewhere in the world. So here I'm, I'm confining myself to the American experience. American journalists, by and large, haven't been enthusiastic about news councils. Um, in fact, you know, we had a national news council in the mid-1970s, and it was more or less killed off single-handedly by the New York Times, who refused to uh, participate in news council decisions. Now, it's difficult to have a national news council in New York City um, survive with any credibility without the blessings of the New York Times. So it was kind of doomed from the beginning. But even before it died, it was a very difficult thing to to maintain, in part because it had no way of getting funding. The Ford Foundation provided some funding. I think the 20th Century Fund provided some funding. But you didn't want to take funding from newspapers, although they do that in Minnesota with the Minnesota News Council, for fear that you're taking money from the very people you're going to be criticizing. But the biggest, biggest problem was what kinds of issues would the News Council take up? The News Council settled on responding to reader complaints. Which is interesting, but readers tend not to complain about issues they're unaware of. You know, they'll complain about how I was treated in the newspaper. That's a very, very limited range of discussions before a news council. So the news council decided, and I think, I think Ellie Abel was uh, on the news council at the time it did this, and it turned out to be a disaster. Intellectually, a very interesting move. Practically, it killed the news council. They decided to issue a series of white papers on topics the news council thought were interesting. No one was complaining about them. But the news council thought they were interesting. One of the white papers had to do with concentration of ownership. Yeah, well, that might be interesting, but why would a newspaper industry want to support discussions of concentration? Well, this is back in the mid-1970s. Um, why would they want to put that high on anyone's agenda? Well, it's very difficult to have an independent news council um, without cooperate, voluntary cooperation from the press, unless you turned it into a state entity, and that creates all sorts of First Amendment problems that I think everyone would want to steer clear of. So if the News Council is going to be non-governmental, a private entity or a public entity separate from the state, it's going to have to have the blessings of the press, and the press has never been terribly enthusiastic about it. The press has done a little more in the area of ombudsman, but still. 15, 1,600 newspapers in the United States. How many ombudsmen do we have? 30-something, right? And most of them you know, are unlike the ombudsman at the Washington Post and the New York. New York Times is a very recent you know, participant. New York Times had poo-pooed the idea, although it was the New York Times 
editor, Abe Raskin, who proposed the idea of, of an ombudsman back in the 1960s. The New York Times never had any interest in it at all and claimed that it was going to be a morale problem having someone in the newsroom look over people's shoulders as they did their work. Well, the New York Times changed its mind in the face of Jason Blair and its own internal investigation. But the best ombudsman set up is the Washington Post, where the ombudsman is appointed on a non-renewable contract, which is saying, you know, say what you need to say. And I guess the New York Times ombuds public editor is now also in, in a similar situation. But say what you need to say, and don't worry about keeping your job, because your job only lasts for two years or three years, whatever the contract is going to be. But most of the ombudsmen in the United States are local PR agents for the newspaper. You know, they're not interested in independent criticism of the newspaper. They're interested in helping the newspaper explain itself to readers. Explain itself to readers. And so their columns tend to be explanations of what the newspaper did, not critiques of the newspaper. And if you look back even at the columns in the New York Times, um, this is a, be a very interesting content analysis. It's still unfolding. You could start to do it. You look at the first um, um, public editor, Daniel Okrant, and you look at the current one, Barney, how do you pronounce his name? Yeah. Enormous difference in, in style, tone, and scope of material um, in terms of what, what they see as interesting topics, um, what kinds of questions they're going to ask, how they're going to devote their column space. And I mean, in my judgment, there's no comparison. I mean, the Okrant was a hard-hitting, independent thinking, and, and the current guy is, I mean, devoted his last column to editor explanation, editor senses of who their readers were, um, which didn't resonate with me at all. Um, and I don't think had any interest. Uh, well, we'll see what the letters are, too. Uh, you can read them online. But it, with the exception of those two movements, the Ombudsman Movement and the News Council Movement, it's very difficult to get journalists to take public accountability seriously. That's not to say editors and reporters aren't eager to sit down and talk about these things. They find them as interesting as anybody finds them. But that's not the point of accountability. Accountability is public accountability, at least in, in the tradition of Habermas, and accountable to a community beyond your professional newsroom. Um, and, and changing the structure of our thinking of, of ethics um, is going to need to go a long way before we're in a position to have institutions in the United States take that notion of accountability seriously. And it's not just journalism. You know, the United States is preoccupied with this notion of individualism and a, a cultural sense of, of the importance of autonomy, which supersedes uh, an appreciation for the notion of, of accountability. So I, you know, I don't mean to single out journalism. I have a particular interest in journalism. But almost any institution in the United States, from education to journalism and anything in between, has an aversion to accountability because it interferes with the notion of autonomy, which is precisely how we define professionalism in the United States. A professional is somebody who has autonomy. Not a, not, it's not somebody who owes an account to the public at large. That's kind of like tacked on to our notion of, of professionalism. And so it's going to require some resistance to that idea of professionalism to make this notion of, of accountability work. But to, to, to wrap this up, I think the challenge for us at, at the university level um, is to take the study of journalism seriously for purposes of finding a connection between the study of journalism and the practice of journalism, recognizing that the practice of journalism um, is the centerpiece of any viable journalism curriculum. That's the centerpiece. And I'm saying it should be. And that part of the practice of journalism is the common sense with which journalists know right from wrong. And I'm, and I'm suggesting we shouldn't dismiss that or poo-poo it or belittle it. We should take it seriously and build on that foundation by providing students with a way to acknowledge where they know and how they know right from wrong, but acknowledging at the same time that that process is flawed and needs to be rehabilitated. And one way, by no means the only way, but one way to rehabilitate it um, is to submit to a process that requires you to be eloquent about what you did and why you did it, and to see that process not as occasional, not as one time, but as ongoing and sustained. And, and if you want a sense of how the process doesn't work, look at what the New York Times does in their corrections box every day on page two. It's exactly what eloquence and accountability shouldn't look like. There are never any names mentioned. It's, it's done in the passive voice. Right? Er errors are attributed to 
editing processes. You know, that was my favorite phrase in that correction box is due to an editing error yesterday, or due to an error in ed an error in editing, an error in editing. Someone screwed up, um, and I want to hear why and how, so I have a better understanding. And I want to hear what you never hear, even 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 when it's leveled against, against Geraldo Rivera. I'm sorry, that nudge wasn't really a nudge. Did you see that one? The New York Times finally acknowledged, well, we looked at the videotape, and the nudge wasn't really a nudge. We acknowledged that, but that's as far as they were willing to go. Not that the story was wrong, or, but no one called on the editor to engage in a discussion. That would have been a very interesting exchange on the op-ed piece if you had the columnist and Geraldo um, talking about the quality of, of his nudge. For those of you unfamiliar with this, my apologies. It's pretty obscure. Anyway, that's as far as I want to go. Let me open it up for whatever discussions and questions you might have. Okay. Here. Tim, thanks for this very interesting um, talk. I have two questions. Uh, I was wondering whether what you call common sense and thinking on the basis of common sense is any different from what in psychology they call uh, implicit knowledge, uh, automatic processing, automatic thinking. If it's not, then what they have found out could be quite informing for the study of common sense and how common sense is used. It might be, and I'm not terribly familiar with that literature. It certainly is what, uh, what's been called tacit knowledge. Yeah. Um, and, and it may be. I'm not familiar with the, the cognitive aspects of it at all. Because there has been lots of uh, uh, research on that particular aspect. And how you described it, I was reminded to it, and I thought it would be uh, an interesting connection to make there. And my other, my other question is, uh, has to do with your uh, description of the relationship between the expert knowledge and the ethical decisions and considerations. And, uh, the point you made is that uh, the ethical argument is almost independent from the expert knowledge. And I was wondering whether you know, the relationship is, isn't more complicated. If it is. about a uh, discussion, you know, let's say about abortion or uh, 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 dying, you know, you mentioned that example. Isn't, even in the discourse ethics of Habermas, the rational argument, the expert's knowledge, the basis of the argument that is made on the ethical basis, you know, somebody would say, I think life starts at the age of three months, uh, right. you know, after conception because, you know, uh, the medical people find some brain functioning at that age. Uh, so the argument is always leaning or based on these uh, uh, scientific uh, arguments. Well, you're right, it is, it's much more complex. One thing, you know, when you talk about everyone participating in this discussion, that includes the experts. You know, the experts have something very, very important to contribute. It's just that their views shouldn't trump the non-experts' views. Now, you, know, you might reasonably say, you know, is there any room for reading the great philosophers in the study of journalism ethics? Yes, because they are models of eloquence, or not, depending on who you're picking, right? But in, in, the, in the ethics course I teach, I have students read both of uh, Cecil Bach's books, one on lying and one on secrets, although neither book has anything to do with journalism. The secrets book has one chapter on journalism. But of course, they're, they're models of public eloquence in my mind. I think Bach is very eloquent about what constitutes lying and what constitutes a secret, and when they're acceptable and when they're not. And I, and I use Bach as a model. You know, it, your goal should be to be able to talk about lying in journalism the way Bach talks about lying in public. Um, so yes, it, I think that they play a very valuable role. I just don't, th I think we run into problems when people defer to the experts and use that as a way of circumventing their own responsibilities. Uh, just sort of a comment, more of a kind of suggestion than a question to sort of relate to that. The, the common sense notions you're developing and, and the relation to tacit knowledge, I think, is, you know, philosophy, et cetera, mm -hmm. is very appropriate. But the strongest examples of those are always motor skills. Yeah. You know, and I, you know, you're using music, you know. Surgery? Yeah. yeah. Surgery, you know, playing a musical instrument, riding a bicycle, typing, you know. All of the things that, in a wonderful Gregory Bateson phrase, sink to lower levels of consciousness, uh, so that they're not, you know, they're, to be operated, they're not, they're not conscious. There's all, but you know, when you get to Gertz, you know, sort of move away from psychology towards 
anthropology, you're now dealing with practice and, or rules of right. social rules, and there's a whole social, which I know you know, yeah. a whole sociological literature on the, the practice of journalism as a set of rules right. Right. that are often not articulated but nonetheless learned and absorbed. You know, there's you know, there's no rules, but don't break them. Yeah. You know? In fact, you know, and, and, and you know, many of you are familiar with this. Gay Tuckman's yeah. study is a study of common sense in the newsrooms, and she unpacks the notion of hard news and soft news in a, in a very interesting way. So, so I think part yeah. of the answer to the to the question that you raise of, of, of the sort of instruction is of that kind of unpacking of the you know of the invisible rules based in part on on what is done. Yeah, I mean, exactly. Like the whole, yeah. I mean, I think of it as the sort of Chicago news tradition, you know, of how does it work? Right, right. How do you make this work? What are all the things that everybody knows? To which I would then add the sort of experience I used to have in a totally different context in dealing with police. This was from a sort of, sort of social activist point of view. And you talk about the, the police who would always refer to the police academy, which this is in Philadelphia. Uh, when you would argue with the police about their practice, their response was to talk about reforming the curriculum in the police academy. I mean, this is what they were willing to talk about. We'll add a unit right. on, you know, not beating people up. You know, at the police academy, we'll give it two hours in the six-week training or something. And my response to that always was, to a series of police commissioners, what is the first thing that a new policeman, the first day on the job, is told? You know, when they arrive at the precinct, what's the first thing? You know? And the answer, I think, is is well known. You know, forget the academy. That's right. The first thing is forget everything they told you at the academy. You know, now we'll show you how it's really done. And my guess is that that's probably sounds like a journalism school graduate going into right. a music. I guess that's probably the first thing that the new. You know, USC BA in journalism or whatever is told when they arrive at a newsroom. If I forget whatever they told you over there. Now we'll talk about how we really do it. Right. And I think that's part of the discussion as well, which is how does that practice differ from the theory? Right. That you can talk. No, that's good. Great. Um, as a journalism educator in the, in the spirit of eloquence, how would you respond to yesterday's op ed? New York Times about the diversity of faculty among journalism schools. I was talking to you. Yeah, yeah. there's, there's a Republican you here, it said. Yeah, that's right. Who's the Republican here? Can I tell him who it is? Yeah. <laughs> and one Green Party member, too. Well, yeah. that didn't make it in the column, though. That's right. David is <laughs> uh, Yeah, I was going to ask in talking about accountability in, in traditional media, if we can do that anymore without taking into context the, the inter internet and the blogs, the, the constant crit criticism now that it's being made, and 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 then the, now more and more a response coming from traditional media to defend itself. And in particular, you're talking about eloquence uh, submitting to, to a process where you were being eloquent. Um, if you look at this, like the Washington Post, where they'll take a reporter and then have them do a forum. Uh, where people can submit questions, and they have to re they have to reply to these questions about their their yeah. coverage. Uh, isn't that a, a, pro a more va a valid process than than uh, the boards or or uh, ombudsmen? It seems to me that it is really engaging the public in a direct conversation rather than having intermediaries like boards, which tend to be uh, yeah. Very I think selective. it's I think it's very exciting. Um, you know, it's not quite institutionalized or it's not very widespread yet, I think it has tremendous potential uh, to, to fill a gap. It, it's somewhere down the road to the extent that we, I don't think you know, we as a society are nearly as, as, uh, as wired as we like to pretend we are at, on campuses. And there's, there's still a have and have nots gap, and so it excludes many, many people systematically um, from, from, fewer, from that fewer process. And fewer and fewer, yes. Fewer but, And it also, and I think, you know, it raises very interesting questions about the authority of the journalist. Um, journalists have the authority to do things on web blogs that they'd get fired for doing on the news pages. And I think that's raising all sorts of interesting questions about who's a journalist and what their authority is and what, what they're entitled to do and be. Um, and I think it's very interesting. I really don't know where it's going to go, but I think you're right. That's the place to, to, to pay some attention to. Ted, I wanted to. Um, ask about the role of, 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 sort of national culture in all this, because 
this looks very different. The, 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 the world of well, Britain is very uh, Britain and Europe it looks very different from this. How do you see these issues changing as you move from country to country? The, well, the issues of of, of um, uh, ethics and journalist education, and, and even more broadly, the idea in the United States of, of um, professionalism. Yeah. Well, you know, you, the, the, almost the fetishization in this country of, of the professional and the, 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 uh, the a profession is is, is learned, not. Yeah. To, um, when you look at uh, there been a number of very interesting volumes in the last few years, collections of essays about journalism being practiced around the world, and, and a couple of things stand out. You know, one is that um, the First Amendment in the United States, as important as it is, and I don't want to in any way argue against its importance, has narrowed our thinking about freedom of the press. We define freedom of the press very narrowly to the point where we can't imagine any role for the state in promoting or expanding the opportunities. For a free press, you know, the only role for the, the only role for the state in the United States is no role, and most countries, with the exception of the United States and very few others, most countries turn to the state to enhance their system of journalism rather than seeing the state as as somehow you know inherently um, wrong and evil and and the enemy. And, and American journalists, you know, we in American culture grow up with the sense that the only way you can have a free state is if the state plays no role in, in our system of freedom of expression. So this notion of accountability can be institutionalized in many societies in ways that it can't be institutionalized here until we get beyond our preoccupation with autonomy and independence and, and a very libertarian uh, view of the role of the state. So I mean, you know, that's one big difference is that, you know, many countries don't understand why the state can't play more of a role in American journalism than well, it does now. We recently had a group of, um, the State Department group, or a group of journalists who are international visitors uh, in to uh, meet the Center on Public Diplomacy. And they wanted to know why the state couldn't make sure that Americans were educated so that they knew about the rest right. of the world, so they knew this, 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 and this, and, and uh, so that American newspapers uh, uh, informed people uh, about, uh, and, uh, about what they needed to know to understand. Um, uh, Central and South America and the Middle East and uh, uh, Africa and they were uh, very frustrated to be told, well, yeah. there's this thing with the the men and there's this, you know, Smith and Montag, all this, all this other stuff was being thrown at them um, as being reasons why the United States government couldn't pursue yeah. those sorts of... And, and, the other, that's right, and the other big difference is, you know, the mechanisms for accountability have been institutionalized throughout the world. You know, the News Council history in, in the Scandinavian countries, you know, the, the Press Complaints Commission in Britain and, and the Royal Commission. I mean, there's a, there's a history elsewhere in the world that's not replicated here in, in the United States. So other, other societies have traditions that they can fall back on, and, and we have a very different set of traditions. And, and it's a traditions that preclude uh, institutionalizing accountability. Session? Yeah, I was wondering if you could talk a little more about the tension in the goal of accountability between the Habermasian vision of uh, consensual discourse around accountability and the antagonistic politics of accountability. And I'm thinking specifically of a couple examples from the U.S. case where, so for example, there's a group in the Bay Area called Youth Media Council, which is a, a youth of color-led organization that organized a whole campaign around a particular radio station's uh, constant repetition of the whole super predator meme. Um, so they organized a campaign around radio station KML and, and you know, organized thousands of uh, young people of color in the Bay Area to you know, write letters, pick it outside the radio station, engage other media, and finally they got you know, an hour on the, on the station, on KML, where they could come and talk from their perspective as young people of color around, you know, racial injustice in the U.S. And not the other example is, you know, say the February 15th anti-war mobilizations where it was really striking that as, as people, you know, in New York came around a, a particular, you know, corner and there's the Fox News, uh, you know, truck, you know, everyone, you know, just starts chanting, you know, shut the Fox up, shut the... So, so there's also this other tradition of accountability which is which is about antagonistic politics and demands, and it's not institutionalized by the state. It comes from, yeah. uh, you know, the people. So 
what role does that play in, in this discussion, I guess, that, that you're no, I mean, it's, it, it's a good question. You know, it raises questions about what's meant by rational dis discourse, too. Um, there, there are a number of interesting books. There's a very good book called Democracy Inclusion um, by Iris Young, where she talks about Habermas's bias in favor of rationality and, and, and arguing that you know, there are many cultures where rational discourse is not the preferred means of discourse. And what we regard as civil discourse, um, others regard as boring and, and inconsequential. And, and, and I'm not sure how to respond to that except to say that if, if we're interested in, in being inclusive in our systems of communication, we're going to have to look beyond simply traditionally rational ways of arguing. You know, that there are other ways of arguing, uh, that there are other modes of communication. And at the same time, this is where I'm going to contradict myself, um, there has to be a way to manage public deliberation. It can't be a free-for-all. Uh, and this goes back to you know, the Mickeljonian idea of, of, of the New, New England town meeting. The point of the New England town meeting wasn't so that everyone get, got a chance to speak. It was so that everything worth saying got a chance to be heard. There's a big difference. And, and Habermas acknowledges that. There's no point in discourse where, you know, um, you know, the same thing gets repeated over and over again to the point where you're drowning out the novel idea. The manager of this discourse has to be sure that all these ideas are getting in. And I think in response to your question, the manager also needs to be concerned with all forms of arguing need to be heard. And, you know, I think that's an editorial judgment. I think that's, you know, what, what a good editor tries to do um, is make judgments about who's going to have access. Because there's still that access question. Uh, as manager of this uh, <laughs> discourse, uh, there are three more questions I'd like to, uh, to acknowledge and then we'll draw around first. Steve. Thank you. Um, I, I, I was uh, struck by your linking of the question of uh, ethics to, the, uh, to, to eloquence which uh, I'm, I'm, my training is in rhetoric, and I teach a uh, course in communication ethics here. And right now, we are reading Aristotle with Nicomachean ethics, and uh, I'm teaching the idea of phronesis or practical wisdom. And um, uh, I try to teach this concept. I talk about uh, uh, the connection between practical wisdom and what Aristotle says practical wisdom is uh, uh, demonstrated by excellence and deliberation. Right. And um, it seems to me that you could make more of this connection by, I, mean, I don't know why you need Gadamer, but you could uh, talk more about Aristotle and the connection there. Uh, when, when, you, um, when, when you emphasize this idea of uh, the relationship between ethics and eloquence, uh, it seems to me uh, that there's uh, uh, this idea that we, uh, uh, it's how we justify a course of action or explain ourselves to others that in the articulation of or explaining ourselves to others, uh, it's it, not just in what we say, but how we explain it, the, the, the facility with which we explain ourselves to others, that we demonstrate, uh, you know, we model ethical reasoning in action, and that that's what, that's a, qual a quality of leadership that we demonstrate in the way we talk about, uh, about ethical decision making, uh, that, 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 that's, that there's something very important there. I mean, um, this is actually one of the reasons why I mean, my beef with George Bush, apart from the, the substance of his policies, is that he's actually they're kind of uniquely rejected uh, this obligation. I mean, it seems to me, you know, we, we elect leaders, uh, 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 it seems to me a president ought to be the chief deliberator to, to, to uh, he takes, model that. He takes thing. pride in not being elected. Yes, exactly. He said this, it was a quote, like, I'm president, I don't have to explain myself to anybody. You, know, you have to do what you want. Um, so, uh, but if you talk about this as an obligation of not only of politicians and, and people we elect to leadership positions, but also of journalists, you know, why why you have to explain yourself? That and if you use that concept of uh, of uh, practicalism or phronesis, uh, the Greek term is too, too technical. But uh, if you use that as a key a way in, rather than Gallimer, maybe that you might. No, in fact, in the, in the written versions, Aristotle does figure prominently. Okay. Um, but Gadamer frankly, helped me understand Aristotle. Okay. I, I, maybe I did it backwards. But. <laughs> yes, and then you'll have our last one. Hi. Um, my question was, when you make reference to this culturally, sp culturally specific common sense, does this differ in any way from what uh, sociological discourse calls like norms or mores or anything like that? Well, norms and mores would certainly inform common sense, but norms and mores aren't always practical in the way common sense would be. But I imagine they overlap considerably. 
But you know, you, you can have different norms and mores and shared common sense. My last question. Um, it, it seems to me that one of the reasons why individual voices turn out to have such attraction to us on the web is, is our desire for accountability in, in who we're reading, etc. But I, I, and I'm wondering if you could talk for a minute about the con how do we come to trust somebody? How does an individual voice establish integrity such, such that we say, oh, this is somebody who actually is worth reading. I trust this person. And that's a great question. And it's a question that, unfortunately, Habermas doesn't deal with well at all. Because Habermas tries to separate out what it is that we know about the speaker from what the speaker is saying. Um, you know, it's a big question. And it's an interesting question for journalism. Um, despite the fact that most people don't pay attention to bylines, you know, to the extent that you're a regular reader of a newspaper and you begin to pay attention to bylines and you begin to trust people, um, I don't know the answer to your question except to say that it's, it's interesting and important. You know, I, I don't know of anyone who's studied that, who has asked or, or interrogated readers for purposes of finding out what is it that you trust about you know, George Will or Johnny Apple or wherever it might be. I don't know. It's a good question, an important one. Call it quits. <laughs> My pleasure.